I would say that it's great to be back, except that we are not really back, of course. But uh, we are going to have to do things uh, this way this year. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, how we set up debug packages in OpenBSD. It's uh, somewhat old work by now. I was supposed to present this last year at EuroBSDCon, which didn't happen, obviously. So uh, I'm doing this from memory. I hope I didn't forget too many details. It's been a long while, actually. Well, that's a good point that uh, we have more, uh, we have had more feedback about how it works, but uh, some details might be a little fuzzy, especially with uh, who did what uh, specifically. So uh, this all started very quickly. Uh, as usual in OpenBSD, it was a hackathon, a port hackathon specifically. In 2019, uh, November, uh, Polyrofty uh, set up a port hackathon in Bucharest. So many thanks, Paul. It was wonderful. And uh, as usual, I was planning on working on something else. And uh, about the first day of the hackathon, uh, he came to me, uh, Paul, uh, telling me that, hey, you know, there's this new stuff in uh, Obscopy and uh, GDB that we can use to actually build uh, debug information into packages because we can now split off uh, debug from the main program. And, uh, well, why not? Let's try that. So how does it work? We, you've got about uh, three lines with uh, uh, link tools. Uh, the first one is to uh, only keep the debug information uh, inside a separate uh, uh, file. So you do up copy uh, dash dash only keep debug and you get the debug information on the side. Then you do some invocation on strip on the program proper so that we lose the debug information in the program. And finally, uh, you got some uh, GNU extension for GDB, uh, which uh, allows the program to figure out that its debug information is actually in the new file that we created. So uh, this is very stupid. Uh, basically, you just uh, cut along the dotted lines and you got your debug information on the site. Uh, so, Quite simple, we tried that and uh, it worked and that's about all. Okay, no, of course not. <laughs> There's still about uh, 30, 45 minutes or talk uh, to talk about. Uh, the thing is that uh, when you get a proof of concept like that, that you figure out you can uh, take out debug information and uh, put it on the side, uh, it's only the first step. And we've got lots of infrastructure details uh, to make things uh, as painless as possible to the poor folks, uh, including me who are going to actually port software to OpenBSD and try to provide uh, debug information uh, for people. Um, so the first thing to do was to actually ship that debug information, uh, which means that uh, on the side of normal packages, you're going to have debug packages. Um, should we make them visible? By this, I mean that uh, in the infrastructure, when you do make package, uh, you are going to uh, actually uh, depend on some cookies that correspond to building each package. So should we add to the list of uh, cookies so that debug packages are full-blown packages? Uh, this was complicated to do, so I decided, okay, let's try something different. Let's try to make debug packages, let's say phantom packages, uh, that don't really exist. Uh, more specifically, uh, instead of creating uh, uh, two packages uh, each time I do make package for simple ports, I'm going to uh, just create one package and on the site, I'm going to also create the debug package so it doesn't really show up all that much in the infrastructure. Uh, as for uh, adding stuff at runtime, uh, this was actually the trivial part uh, because um, for updates, we've got update signatures for normal packages and it was uh, 
completely straightforward to just say, okay, the debug package is going to have the exact same signature as the normal package, so that when you update the normal package, the debug package will update as well at the same time in synchronization. That was really the, <laughs> the only part uh, that worked from the from the start without needing uh, any further changes to make things work better. Uh, since we were at a hackathon, it was a perfect location to do some rapid development. Uh, so like I said, um, make package in a nutshell, it's just make package cookies uh, because it's open BSD and we have multi packages, etc. We'll come back to that later. Um, as far as the debug packages go, we chose, well, I chose a very simple naming convention. I just prepended debug to the front of the package name uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason is that we don't have uh, packages which start with debug. And the second reason was simply that when you look at the full listing for all packages uh, on a snapshot, uh, if you put everything with debug at the front, uh, you're going to have a perfectly normal listing with just few pages of debug packages, but it's not like uh, you are going to scatter uh, debug packages names all over the place. Uh, I could also have decided to put them in a separate directory, but for mirrors and stuff like that, this meant that I uh, would have to add some logic uh, that I didn't want to. I wanted to make things as simple as possible. So, uh, as far as creating debug information, the first iteration was simply to add the variable to the make file, debug files, uh, which listed explicitly uh, which files we wanted debug information for, uh, on which we apply the object copy transformation. And uh, the first iteration as well, I wrote the packing list manually. Uh, it was just enough as a proof of concept to allow people to play with it and uh, figure out whether they did manage to get uh, uh, debug packages that made sense for them. First iteration, obviously, it's not going to stay that way, but uh, having lots of uh, beta testers in the room, crash test uh, developers, I would say, uh, that was the, the way to go, I think. Uh, as far as creating debug packages, it should be uh, done manually. Uh, just having debug files defined in the make file was enough. Uh, also, we added obviously extra configure arguments to the configure step. Uh, at this point, most of uh, was ready to go through configure and simply add minus G to the C flags and remove strip from the install part. And, uh, and that was it. So, uh, I think that of the room of developers, there were something like 20 of us. Uh, most of them did try uh, that configuration and figured out that, uh, okay, we have actual debug packages that work. It was great. And of course, I got some suggestions. Um, Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, let me show you how this looked at that point. Uh, this is just a small fragments from uh, the parts infrastructure. Uh, so basically, we have three variables, debug packages, to say, okay, we are going to have some actual uh, extra packages, debug files, the stuff that does the object copy uh, routine and uh, debug configure args just in case that uh, configure cannot uh, do stuff automatically that you have to to override things. Uh, since we are OpenBSD, we have multi packages and flavors. How does that work? Uh, this is just a summary of basic information uh, regarding OpenBSD. Um, we do build stuff once. Uh, we pre-install into a staging area called fake, and then uh, we are going to split, uh, possibly, uh, the install information into several sub-packages. 
Like for instance, if you have uh, big stuff like uh, parts of Qt, you might have uh, the main program, you might have some uh, sample demos and some extra documentation on the site, which uh, gives you uh, three separate sub packages. Uh, so more or less at first, uh, we just create, uh, we just name a debug package file for uh, each of those sub packages. And uh, in order to split off documentation from the start, uh, any package which uh, doesn't have an actual architecture, uh, if package arch is equal to star, that means that this is the same sub package for uh, everything which is more or less a documentation package, uh, then uh, we are not going to actually have a debug package cookie for uh, that specific sub package. And that's it, that takes care of almost uh, every case where uh, you don't want to have uh, an empty debug package. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, if you have some of those variables not empty, uh, line 19 in this slide, uh, you are going to have some really straightforward uh, debug options. Uh, like you don't strip during install, you add some debug flags, and that's it. Uh, and finally, there was the adding the, the, the creation of the debug packages proper. So more or less, uh, instead of doing a straightforward uh, create package, I put that into a uh, make file variable, like create package for sub package S. And uh, in case we have debug package set, so starting from line 41, uh, you are going to have a second uh, call to create package to actually uh, create the debug package with some more or less the same options as the normal create package, uh, apart from taking the packing list from somewhere and uh, creating some group. Really straightforward, very simple stuff. Um, the only fun things here is that we reuse the exact same dependency information as the normal package, which does ensure that we are going to get the exact same update signature for uh, the debug package and uh, the normal package. Uh, finally, uh, there was the use of debug files. Uh, so uh, just uh, add an extra target, which is going to uh, do the OPS copy dance for uh, every file uh, and debug files. Uh, at first, I didn't know what to do with a static library. So there was uh, a set, a test, sorry, uh, in line 62 that I'm going to do the same thing for each uh, binary and uh, shared object. And I'm not going to do the same thing for static libraries. Later on, I realized that I didn't want to have to do anything with static libraries, so that part is really not interesting at all. Uh, so this was the first iteration, and uh, even though it worked, it was a lot uh, of manual interaction for people. So the first feedback I got that, okay, uh, this works, but we need to do something uh, that uh, should be uh, simpler to use. Uh, so I decided to reuse uh, previous work. So if you refer to <laughs> one of the last uh, Eurobase con, I talked about uh, how I rewrote update playlist. And uh, more or less update playlist does most of what we want. Uh, it does possibly read existing packing lists. It does possibly scan the information under the um, staging area, under fake. And, well, packing list under OpenBSD are annotated. You've got stuff that says, okay, this is a binary, this is a shared object. Uh, we just needed an extra annotation for this is a loading module without any version information, which was trivial to add. 
And uh, after that, uh, we can just reuse the exact code from update playlist to uh, actually grab the debug information and do something with it. Let me check the time. Okay. Um, So why was it simple to do? It's because of the playlist, uh, as I said in a previous talk, is already fully object oriented. Uh, like uh, it grabs all the information it needs directly from uh, package create arguments, which means that already we have a parser which is common to uh, package create and to update playlist uh, with a specific derived subclass for update playlist. And uh, we just need to reuse that class and change a few details uh, to have our build debug info tool uh, reuse most of the code. Uh, one very, very important uh, part about that is that uh, this means that whenever we change something in the infrastructure, we add some new annotation, uh, some new features, uh, most of the code is uh, Inherited. You don't have to rewrite everything from scratch. Uh, if you have, say, 95% of the support required to uh, handle some new annotation or some new class of files, uh, then uh, you just need to write the five remaining percent, uh, and that's it. You don't have to do everything from scratch. Uh, Okay, the only part that was a bit clunky uh, at that point was uh, how we are going to do uh, the obscopy dance. So uh, the second iteration of the tool did create a debug info file, which contained uh, line two, uh, free informations for each file. Uh, the debug path, where we're going to put the data, uh, the original program name, uh, and uh, the actual debug uh, info file. Uh, so uh, this is still a bit clunky for various reasons. I don't know why I did it that way because the uh, actual way to do things uh, should be obvious. Uh, I'll let you think about it. You get the answer in a few slides. Uh, don't pick your head. But uh, this seems to work just fine for starters. Uh, at which point I got some very specific feedback from friends. Uh, I've selected uh, two of them, uh, which were most significant. Uh, Stuart Anderson uh, is in charge more or less of everything uh, mirrors uh, related to packages. So we figured out that debug packages is going to grow the mirror size a lot. Uh, which is why we decided to make them opt-in. Like, uh, it does not make sense to actually create a debug package for everything under OpenBSD. Uh, there are lots of programs which takes less than one minute to compile without any dependencies. And unless they are really critical, uh, anybody can uh, create debug packages uh, for them on their own. Uh, the Real benefit in uh, having debug packages is for stuff that is large. Like, for instance, you don't want to recompile Qt5 or, uh, I don't know, Mozilla or uh, GIMP from scratch. Uh, those are cases where uh, you're going to gain a lot of time uh, having debug packages. Uh, also, uh, coping with uh, every architecture we support didn't seem like a good idea at the time uh, for two reasons. Uh, first one was uh, it would grow the mirror size even uh, worse. And the second reason is that we still compile file things natively on OpenBSD. So 32-bit uh, architectures are uh, not likely to get uh, debug packages easily uh, because if you are already uh, close to the to the limit uh, when you try to compile stuff on 32-bit arches, uh, then uh, it's very likely that debug information uh, is going to push them over the edge. Uh, we can revisit uh, those decisions later but uh, we did focus on uh, actually debugging uh, stuff uh, 
that will be arch independent first. So MD64, and then we possibly extend it to other 64-bit uh, architectures. And then for some packages, we can extend it to 32-bit architectures. Uh, so that was it with uh, Stuart, and uh, it was a good idea. Uh, Antoine Jacotto also gave me some uh, fairly pertinent advice. Uh, as usual with Antoine, it's, hey, I tried to do that stuff and it doesn't really work. Uh, like some Python packages <laughs> didn't want uh, to have debug. So looking closer, uh, it was obvious in retrospect. Uh, that's because if you have our links, then the obscure dance won't work. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, two links to the same program, the first a uh, strip is going to remove the debug information from that program. And of course, the second obscopy won't be able to find anything. So let me give you a better picture. Uh, the second iteration of uh, debug packages was simply to say, okay, we have a packing list data. We are going to process that using package create arguments through build debug info. And that will give us debug packing list and some kind of uh, list for debug files. Uh, but uh, if we want to uh, take uh, hard links into account, we have to uh, just uh, take uh, the staging area information as well. So build debug info. Uh, on top of packing lists is also going to uh, reuse uh, the information from the staging area to figure out which files are actually hard links. And uh, as you can see from the warning signs, the debug files list uh, is probably going to be a bit more complicated because uh, you can do the same thing with uh, normal files with a single link and uh, files which have an actual uh, hard link. More specifically, so uh, in the simple case, if you have uh, two links, uh, two names for the same program A and B, uh, then uh, the first time you create the debug information for A, and naturally B uh, is going to point to the debug information for A. Uh, with most binaries, you don't have to do anything. Uh, the only snag is that uh, the debug link uh, that you stuff into your program does not have a full path. So if A and B actually live in separate directories, you will still need to do a link for debug information. Because uh, if I come back to the one of the first slides, that one, uh, okay, you see here, uh, line three, that uh, the debug file information, it's called dot debug slash program dot dbg. So uh, it's uh, located under the same directory as the original program. So if your hard link uh, lives somewhere else, you have to uh, create a link to the debug information as well. And that's more or less it. This is the algorithm we are going to have to use. Um, so, like I said earlier, we are in multi packages land. So, um, there is another part of multi packages uh, which needed to work in this case. Uh, which is that actually we don't build all packages, all sub packages for all architectures all the time. Uh, we have this stuff which is called um, pseudo flavors uh, that you said to say, okay, in this case, because I don't have this dependency, uh, I'm not going to build this specific sub package. So there was a bit of glue to write uh, in uh, the infrastructure uh, to make sure that uh, I would only try to build debug packages for packages, sub-packages, sorry, which are arch-dependent, uh, 
uh, no debug packages for documentation, and also trim down the list uh, to remove packages that we are actually not building at this time for this architecture. Uh, this is just a detail. I'm not going to expand more about that. Uh, it's just the kind of stuff that, uh, okay, you have tens of very small uh, uh, details to take care of uh, until everything works uh, perfectly. So, uh, once we set up multi-packages, uh, our infrastructure will remove stuff from build, to create build packages. Uh, so, uh, in the end, uh, we just set debug packages equal uh, build packages. Uh, and since Mac is lazy, uh, this won't get evaluated until build packages uh, is actually set. And this means that we don't have more to do. We just need to actually remove Arch independent packages. And that's it. We have uh, perfectly accurate uh, debug packages set. You could still set debug packages manually to a subset. Like for instance, if you have a main application and everything else you don't really need to debug, you could just generate one debug packages. But so far, I don't think we have we have actually used that for real. Uh, the next problem was a problem of workflow. Uh, if you remember at this point, uh, we create the debug information during the staging uh, part. But when we update a port, at some point we need to run update playlist. But in order to do that, we need for fake to finish. And uh, at this point, so second iteration of uh, the debug packages work, uh, we do the staging area normally, and we run the uh, copy debug info target at the end of fake. So if some files are no longer there, which is quite possible because the packing list hasn't been updated already, then our loop to extract debug information is going to fail. Uh, possibly even worse, uh, if there are new binaries, they are not going to get through that loop. Um, so, first thing is uh, that um, possibly uh, it might fail, which is a bad idea. So uh, we have to have uh, copy debug info uh, just uh, once if there are any issues, which isn't a good idea because people don't always look at warning messages. They need actually errors to stop and uh, reflect on what's going on. And also you might create debug packages that do not contain everything. So uh, the actual solution was to wait until make package to run build debug info uh, and have it extract the debugging information. Uh, not really, uh, but create some make file that will extract the debugging information. Uh, so uh, instead of having uh, make package extract the debugging information each and every time. Uh, it does depend on the makefile that actually extracts the debugging information. And that makefile gets updated every time uh, makefake is run again, uh, which means that we do it just once, which is great. Uh, because uh, we finish fake, we do update playlist, then we do make package. If the playlist has been updated, then it will recreate a make file which is up to date with every binary we need to extract debug information from. And also because it's a make file, uh, each debug file is actually depending on the underlying file with debug information. So we run a copy just once. If it's already been run, then next time it won't happen again. So we don't have the problem that we try to extract debug information from a file that's already been handled. 
uh, in retrospect, this is much simpler than the second iteration I had. Uh, I had lots of problem of chicken and egg between uh, debug information and file and uh, creating uh, scripts that uh, extract debug information. Okay, we have files that depend on other stuff. It's what make files have been uh, made for. So how does it look in practice? Uh, here is an instance of a generating make file. Um, we have two rules which are a bit complicated. Uh, Obscopy rule is the, we create the debug directory first. Uh, then if we are privilege separated, which means that we are actually uh, uh, running stuff as a different user for the, the staging uh, information, uh, we have to extract uh, the stats of the file we want uh, to change. We have to make it read-write because most binaries are usually read and execute only. Uh, we, I added a check on line 8 and 9, uh, checking whether we were actually uh, getting uh, debug information. So this is the first indication that something went wrong during configure and build. If you don't find any debug information in some file, it means that some stupid framework managed to strip the debug information because before you had any access to it. Uh, then you do the code that we talked about, the Obscopy Dance. Uh, I'll talk about DWZ later. And then you restore the original permissions to your file, and that's it. Uh, for links, uh, you got a second tool, line 18 and 19, uh, which is stupidly that you create a link from uh, the original debug information to a final debug information. And then you simply have uh, a list of targets uh, where uh, every uh, debug file is just uh, depending on the actual normal file and invokes either the obscopy rule or the link rule. Uh, okay, this make file does uh, fall off the right hand, but uh, it's not really interesting to know what's going on on, on the right side. Uh, so this made for a much improved workflow for creating debug packages. In the old process, you had to run fake uh, staging area, which generates some debug info, which may or may not be accurate. Then you run update playlist, which will invalidate the meta info and necessary for files to debug. So before actually packaging, you need to remove the staging area, recreate the staging area, which does take some time for big ports. Uh, and it was frankly a major pain to do things that way. So in the new process, uh, you do make fake. There is no debugging info uh, involved at this stage. You run update playlist. Then at the start of make package, you create debug info, which is accurate, which corresponds to the staging area and the updated packing list. And you end up with uh, up-to-date uh, packages. End of story, this was much cleaner and uh, it worked much better. So, uh, okay, just some details. Um, if we uh, run my package uh, once and created the debug info, uh, we just need to have some up-to-date uh, dependencies in the make file. Uh, so, uh, but we don't need to extract the debug information it's, if it's already been down. Uh, on the other side, uh, if we run update playlist, then we regenerate the make file for debug information. And that make file, which will consider each file one after the other and uh, extract debug information or not for that file. Uh, there is a small edge case where it might not work. 
specifically if we had a given program in a version uh, of the packing list and in the next version we have the same program and a hard link to, to that program, then maybe the order might be wrong and we might try to extract debug information from the wrong I notes, from the, sorry, wrong file name. So far, we haven't run into it. Uh, it's the one case where you might have to clean fake and uh, do things again. And uh, otherwise, it just works. Uh, so uh, to sum up uh, things from uh, Porter's point of view, uh, you need to opt in, you need to create, uh, to declare which packages you want debug stuff for um, in order to, to keep the repository uh, under a manageable size. Uh, it's not just only the size needed for mirrors, but you got to realize that uh, we have new snapshots every few days for MD64, like every two or three days, uh, which means that uh, you need to find out a large number of uh, files to each mirror. Uh, which takes some bandwidth, obviously. So if you grow the repository too much, uh, it will take more time for packages to end up on each mirror, which makes things less useful, actually. Um, so opt-in is mostly debug packages equal build packages, and that's it. Uh, in most cases, 95% of the time, you don't need to do anything to have debug information generated uh, correctly. Um, and uh, the part that actually processes uh, the staging area and creates the debug packages is entirely automatic. I haven't had to add any exceptions to that part. It's very specific. As long as the packing list are uh, up to date, as long as you have actual annotations uh, for binary shared libraries and modules, uh, then the part that creates debug packages is entirely automatic. Uh, a quick flashback to DWZ if I have time. Mm. Yeah, I have. Uh, so this is a tool that was found, I think, by uh, Brian Callahan, or maybe with a bit of help with uh, Jeremy Courage-Andreau as well, uh, to make the debug packages a bit smaller. Uh, turns out that uh, whatever ends up uh, as dwarf debug information is not as small, as small as it could be. And some people wrote a nice tool that makes it a little bit more compact. Uh, so that's just the detail that uh, we depend on uh, DWZ for everything except DWZ, which has to be able to call itself uh, to compress its debug information. Uh, turned out to be interesting, uh, like there are some cases where the debug information is complex enough, uh, Mozilla, that uh, DWZ won't work. But uh, apart from that, uh, it shrunk uh, debug packages by about 10%, uh, which is not too shabby considering that uh, debug packages are already compressed uh, with Zlib. Uh, on the packages side, there are a few things to do, actually. Uh, at first, uh, I simply did, okay, you just package uh, the debug stuff that you want, and you are able to debug stuff but you have some uh, shearing effects. Uh, most specifically, in order for GDB to work correctly, uh, it has to have a perfect match between uh, binary packages and the debug information. Uh, otherwise, it's going to crash in uh, awful ways. So uh, the way uh, the dwarf people uh, made things work is that uh, each program generates um, a specific hash for uh, its binary code, and uh, that hash is going to be the exact same hash for the uh, debug program, uh, for the debug information that matches this program. So each time you actually recompile this, 
uh, you are going to create uh, some uh, new magical edges for debug information. And so if you have uh, a given package and a debug package, which are off by just a little bit, uh, that's enough for debug information not to work. So in case you are working with releases, this is not a problem, but obviously uh, in case you want to work with snapshots, uh, you're going to have some issues. If you say, if you install some application and then later on you figure out that, okay, I have a bug in this application, I want to debug it. Uh, then you have to actually reinstall the application and the debug package most of the time. Uh, because uh, the debug packages that you are going to find on the mirror are not uh, the same ones that the application was compiled with. So uh, I just added some two very simple uh, options to package that to deal with it. Uh, the first one was to add an option minus D. Surprisingly enough, I did not use minus D for anything yet. Uh, to automatically uh, install and update debug packages when available um, silently, which means that uh, if you don't have a debug package for something, it's not an error. You just add debug packages to the list of stuff that uh, could be uh, added, updated if they exist, uh, which takes a lot of room on your system. And the second option, which is what we use most of the time and which is the preferred option for developers, uh, which is to set a directory as debug package cache. And each time you add or update a package, uh, then it's going to look for the corresponding debug packages and it's going to save them for you in their compressed state in that uh, debug directory. Uh, which means that later on, if you want to actually debug something, uh, you just install the debug packages from your cache and you have the warranty that these uh, debug packages are going to be 100% uh, up to date uh, with respect to your package. Uh, specifically because maybe the package and the snapshot uh, uh, mirror is going to be different but each time you update the package on your machine, uh, it decides that to look for the debug package and download it as well to the debug cache. And that's enough. It ensures that each time you get a package, you have the debug package on the side as well. Uh, I think that's about all. We are something like two years later. Uh, I've looked at some numbers. We have these days something like 700 uh, debug packages on OpenBSD, uh, which means that uh, most uh, significant stuff actually has debug packages. Uh, like we said, it's opt-in, which means that uh, other stuff doesn't have debug packages because no one saw a need for that. Uh, small packages, stuff that are actually uh, uh, interpreted stuff for the most part. Uh, we could easily create debug packages for more stuff, but so far it hasn't been useful. There are still a few remaining issues, like some frameworks make it complicated to have debug information on the site. Uh, those poor souls who are working with CMake know what I'm talking about, where you have a release mode and a debug mode, which are completely different. And basically here, what we want to do is we want to stay in release mode, but compile stuff with minus G and strip stuff uh, during the fake stage. And CMake doesn't make it very easy to do, but I think that more or less it works this way, these days. Uh, there's always the open issue that uh, compilers and linkers are not perfect, so adding minus G might change the compilation and linking to chain a bit, and you might end up with binaries which are slightly different from what you get when you just run your optimizers. And finally, there's the question of uh, for newer or smaller platforms, 
uh, which platforms you want debug packages for. Do we want them for WIS5 or uh, do we want them for Spark 64 or IM64? Uh, that's really easy to do. We just need to add the platform to uh, debug architectures and see what crashes. Uh, this is not work uh, I've been doing. This is stuff I'm delegating to people who are in charge of such architectures. Uh, just to be said that uh, what we have here uh, works just fine for MD64 and can be used for about anything else. Uh, okay, um, more or less on time. Uh, do I have any questions? Yes, yes. Yes, there was a, um, a question from Fred Finster uh, who's raised his hand. Uh, I'm Fred, please go ahead. On the slide, not on the slide. It, it, it does things. In the thing, almost secretly, it's not very visible. Yeah. This is Christoph says in the chat. Um, yeah, please uh, feel any questions. Uh, the room will pause in, in about nine minutes uh, before the the next talk. So if you mark no. if you. Yeah, sure. I'm around. Yeah. I hope it was uh, possible to understand things so far. Yes. I guess we'll be looking at the whatever turns up in the chat then. Uh, mm -hmm. Several people, people are typing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't understand the old sales, we love the end result. Yes, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it was mostly to explain that something that's actually very simple in concept can lead to lots of small details to implement. <laughs> and I think we're on to the applause then. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your talk, uh, Mark. I uh, hope we will, ne ne next year, hopefully, we'll, we'll do this um, um, yeah. Yeah, a, a physical conference. Um, the, the cool thing that this year it was supposed to be in Vienna and uh, actually no Vienna, it wasn't all that bad to uh, this. Uh, sort of thing. I think, I think we, uh, we probably will be announcing it at the end of the conference that there will be a physical conference in Vienna next year. So, cool. um, so uh, I have to work on something to be able to come. So. Um, yeah. So we basically, we'll need to think of think of something to say then. Um, I think. If there are no further questions, um, as I said, this this room will uh, go away for a few moments in a few minutes. The next mm -hmm. talks are up at um, uh, 11.45 in this room. Mm -hmm. um, the the next talk is from Peter Chanik, working with uh, BSD Ports. I think it's a FreeBSD guy. Uh, in the other room, there's a Ghost BSD talk by Andy, uh, Andy Arts. Um, so um, please feel feel free to mingle. There is also the spatial spatial little chat that you've got a link for. Has uh, yes. several sub rooms with the hangouts. Uh, can you repost the, the link to the to the chat because uh, it's chat reset and I didn't save it last time. <laughs> the spatial chat was. Um, hang on, uh, you were okay. L yeah. Luna, thank you. Thank you. Oh yes, uh, yeah. Luna already pasted. Okay, so since there doesn't seem to be any more questions, I'm going to give back the microphone and the webcam. Right, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Hopefully, see you next year.